Now let us read again Nehemiah chapter 6, as we read the first half, verses 1 through 9, our text this morning. I trust it will all make a lot more sense to you. And then the second half, 10 through 19, that's tonight's text. Nehemiah 6. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had builded the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand, wherein was written, It is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu, or Geshem, saith it, that thou and the Jews think to rebel. For which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king, according to these words? And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. And now shall it be reported to the king, Artaxerxes, according to these words, Come now therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent on to him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them out of thine own heart. For they all made, or attempted to make, us afraid, saying, their hands shall be weakened from the work that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabil, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that, being as I am, would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him but that he prophesied, pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin, and that they might have a matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So the wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month Elul in fifty and two days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, that they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Moreover, in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, and his son Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshullam, the son of Berechiah. Also, 
they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Amen. This morning, beloved, we saw that the attack in Nehemiah 6 focuses not on the people of Judah, that's Nehemiah 4 and Nehemiah 5, but on the leader of Judah, Nehemiah himself. And tonight, we're going to emphasize that this opposition to Nehemiah in chapter 6 is or was continual. And this came out in various ways this morning in our study of the first nine verses of this chapter. You will recall that Sanballat and Geshem sent Nehemiah an evil message of invitation. Then they sent three more. Then they sent an open letter. Five efforts so that they were nothing if not persistent in their wicked wiles. And tonight, we're going to see that they still continued their attacks. Five volleys were not enough. They continued their attacks through Shemaiah, the bribed prophet, in verses 10 through 13, through other false prophets, and even through a false prophet Tess in verse 14. And then, because they still weren't done, then there are more letters and more rumors in verses 17 through 19. Letters and rumors spread by traitors in Judah who are in cahoots with wicked Tobiah. So that there is no let up for Nehemiah, or by extension, for the servants of Christ who are seeking the welfare of the church and to build up the defenses of spiritual Jerusalem. You may also have noticed that not only is there one man especially attacked, Nehemiah, but there is one man who is the outstanding and main enemy of Nehemiah. And so, by extension, the word of God, the people of God, in verses 10 through 19. Everywhere else in Nehemiah, where Sanballat and Tobiah are mentioned together, everywhere else, Sanballat is mentioned first. But in our text tonight, the order is inverted. Verse 12, Tobiah and Sanballat had hired Shemaiah. Verse 14, My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their evil works. Added to that, Tobiah is even mentioned apart from and without Sanballat in verses 17 through 19, several times. And this, of course, raises the question. Why the prominence of Tobiah in tonight's text, whereas previously Sanballat was the number one opponent? And the answer is that Nehemiah 6, verses 10 through 19, deals with traitors inside the church and Tobiah was the one out of that evil trinity Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem Tobiah was the one who had insinuated himself into the interests and affections affections of people within Judah he had more ties more contacts within the church than Sanballat or Geshem had. And then the next question is, logically enough, how was it 
that Tobiah was able to make so much inroads into the church, and in parentheses, despite the fact that he was a wicked rogue from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And the answer is that he played the religion card. That is, he pretended that he was really spiritual and that he had an interest in the Jews' religion. And let me show this to you. That name Tobiah is striking because Tobiah consists of two parts. The Aya bit at the end, I-A-H in English transliteration, is from Jehovah. And the Tob, T-O-B, that comes from the Hebrew word Tov, which means good. So his name actually means Jehovah. Think back to the sermons on Exodus 3. I am that I am. Jehovah is good. Strange name for a pagan, isn't it? Jehovah is good. And our text mentions this too, that he and his wife, one or both of them, they called one of their sons Johanan. And Jo also comes from Jehovah, J-O. And you can put Jehovah into a personal name at the start, where it's Jo or Jeho. And you can put it at the end, where it's I-A-H. And then Hanan is the Hebrew for grace. So his name is Jehovah is good. And Johanan's name means Jehovah is gracious. Huh. And then we should add that Nehemiah 13 verses 4 through 9 indicates, amongst very many other things, that this Tobiah claimed to care for God's temple in Jerusalem. But don't be deceived for one minute. Even though there are some in the church world who are duped, even by the merest of pretenses from pagans that they really kind of like Christianity and that, that they sort of deep down believe in the gospel. Because by their deeds, just as with Tobiah, they reveal themselves to be the enemies of Jesus Christ. No matter what name they may have or how they say, I like the temple, don't be fooled. Besides playing the religious card and playing it better than Sanballat and Geshem, besides that, Tobiah also deliberately cultivated relationships within Judah. He liked to have friends on the inside. And he did this by means of money and marriages. He's a wealthy, generous man. He's an in-law. He's a good guy. No, he's not. He's just using traitors in the church for his own evil ends. He even cultivated relationships within the church by oaths and correspondences. And we'll see more about that towards the end of tonight's sermon. And on the subject of end, tonight's sermon takes us to the end of the building of the walls of Jerusalem. Today, we celebrate a great work of God in completing the perimeter defenses. Today's sermon also marks the end of the first section of the book, because Nehemiah chapters 1 through 6 is a unit. And tonight's sermon takes us to the end of this sermon series until three Sundays from now when we shall resume with Nehemiah 7, Lord willing. Because for the next two Sundays, Reverend James Lanning will be leading the services. Now let's consider continual opposition to Nehemiah, the false prophets, and I'm also including here the false prophetess, 
That's in verses 10 through 14. The finished walls, verses 15 and 16, and the fifth column. Now, some of you may have looked at the bulletin, which explains the meaning of a fifth column and even the origin of the term fifth column from the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. The fifth column is a traitorous group on the inside. So we have here tonight the continual opposition to Nehemiah, the false prophets, the finished walls, and the fifth column. You can almost see the thought processes of the enemies without, Tobiah and Sanballat. This is what they're thinking. How are we going to destroy Nehemiah? I mean, it's that, it's that, that's it. Like. So that the people of Judah will no longer follow him, and so that the gates are not hung, and the wall will not be completed. Because after all, who is Nehemiah going to listen to? He isn't listening to us. Sanballat and Geshem say to themselves, we've invited him to a meeting and he's rejected our invitation five times. What we actually need is somebody in Jerusalem. We need a Jew in Jerusalem. Better yet, we need a prophet who's a Jew in Jerusalem. Because Nehemiah is a religious person and he will listen to a Jewish prophet who claims to speak for God. And you can see the board, as it were, at the table saying, yeah, that's a good idea. That's what we should do. Okay, does anyone here know anybody who fits the bill? Tobiah puts his hand up. I have just the guy in mind. Shemaiah, the son of Deliah. In fact, not only have I got him, but I have developed relationships with several men and women in Jerusalem who fulfill the qualifications, and I can call upon them. Because it's always good to have several irons in the fire. You need backup if the others fail, so that you can appeal to several traitors in the church to do your dirty business for you. One may not be enough. We need a, a large fifth column, a well-flanked and populated fifth column inside the church. Yeah, good idea. That's it, Tobiah. We're right behind you. Well, how are we going to enlist these men? Don't worry, says Tobiah. I have many means of communications with our friends within Jerusalem, the church. And verses 17 through 19 make this very clear. And as everyone knows, every man and woman has a price. That is, I can bribe them. And now think back, chapter 3. Chapter 3 tells the truth. Chapter 3 didn't tell all the truth of the people building the, Jer the Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem. You see a united people all working together. And yet, even then, in the number one instance of the people of God working together in the Old Testament, there are still traitors in the church. Men like Shemaim and women like Nohadiah. Now, who was responsible for the specific details of the plan? Was it Tobiah and Sanballat on the outside, communicating with the false prophets, telling them how they should get this over? Or was it generally submitted to Shemaiah on the inside? You should entrap Nehemiah, and we'll leave it to your ingenuity as to how you're going to go about it. Was it perhaps some mixture of both? We're not told, so we pass this by. But the plan that was adopted involved invitations to certain places. No longer to invite Nehemiah to the plain of Ono outside Jerusalem in order to meet Sanballat and Geshem. The new plan 
involves inviting Nehemiah to places inside Jerusalem, since he showed that he doesn't want to leave the city. First of all, he's invited to Shemaiah's house. That's part one. And Nehemiah accepted that invitation, and he went to Shemaiah's house. And then second, he was to be invited in the holy place in the temple, part two. And by the holy place in the temple, we mean the second chamber. So is the holy of holies, where the ark originally was. And then the next room, the holy place, where you would have the candlesticks and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. How are we going to get him into the holy place of the temple? The plan was security reasons. They were going to tell Nehemiah that people would come to murder him that very night. Verse 10. Shemaiah told Nehemiah after he came to the first meeting, about the second meeting, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee yea in the night will they come to slay thee and here we have several persuasive ploys by Shemaiah first of all he's speaking here prophetic words claiming to be divinely inspired in his utterance. And verse 12 uses the word prophecy, the standard Old Testament word for prophecy, bubbling over with a word from God. Secondly, he claims to come with a prophetic message, the sort of thing that a prophet would say. It involves the temple. And there are many prophetic utterances involving the temple. Because God dwelt there. And the temple is a place of security. And even Joash, King Joash, Judah's seventh king, was protected in and around the temple. Though not in the holy place. The prophetic message involves issues pertaining to the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not kill, which includes taking appropriate measures to stop murder, including the murder of yourself. So he's claiming to be inspired with a religious message that from various perspectives looks prophetic. And then, to reinforce it and make it more vivid, Shemaiah engages in a prophetic symbolic action. You see this sort of thing in the Bible, sometimes in the New Testament. It's more usual in the Old Testament. The symbolic action here is that Shemaiah was shut up. That, he was conf that is, he was confined in his house. And that was why he invited Nehemiah to meet him in his house. He said, I'm under divine compulsion to remain in my house. You must come and meet me. And then when he got there, he said, this symbolic action of me being shut up in my own personal house and home symbolizes that you, Nehemiah, should be shut up and confined in God's house, the temple, to reinforce the message. And Shemaiah also brought in the issue of a prophetic company. I'm going to go with you. You won't be alone when you're holed up inside the second chamber of the temple. Both of us will find refuge together in the house of God. And so it seems persuasive, convincing. And then the question is, how did Nehemiah respond to Shemaiah's exhortation. Well, he immediately told the prophet that this ill befitted his office. Nehemiah is conscious, without being arrogant, that he is God's man. He's divinely commissioned 
to build Jerusalem's wall. And this sort of behavior that the prophet is, is exhorting him to doesn't fit with that. Verse 11, I said, Nehemiah speaking, should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am, with this divine calling in this office, with this task entrusted to me, who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And so Nehemiah here realized that traps were being laid for him. Because were he to follow such measures, he would leave himself open to many charges. Here's one, cowardice. Cowardice. This guy is going into the temple at night to save his own skin. There are the perimeter walls, then there's the walls around the temple, and then there's the big heavy doors of the walls and the walls of the temple building proper. Boy, he's looking after himself, isn't he? He would also be charged with self-seeking because the rest of us, we have to take it in turns to go on these walls and do guard duty to protect everybody within and ourselves and our family but nehemiah oh he just shies off to the temple he's more interested in looking after number one and then because things are getting even worse and even clearer nehemiah would be trespassing in the temple because nehemiah is not a priest or even a levite He's not allowed in the second chamber of the temple. There are laws against that sort of thing. But maybe Nehemiah thinks he's above the law of God because he's so special. And this would revive the rumors of messianic claims. You may recall that King Uzziah went into that second chamber of the temple, the holy place, he got above his station. He thought, I'm king, and I would like to offer the incense in the holy place. Second Chronicles chapter 26, God struck him with leprosy, so that he never again was able even to get into the temple courtyards. And now Nehemiah, who doubtless knows what happened, King Uzziah, Nehemiah is going to do this. He evidently thinks he's better than King Uzziah and that he's going to get away with it so there must be something to the rumors that he's wanting to make himself a king over Judah and of course he's going to be charged with being a hypocrite Nehemiah has been telling us and exhorting us and encouraging us for weeks after weeks because he wants us to complete the city walls whereas this guy is extra safely ensconced even behind the temple walls. Oh, it's okay for the rest of us to work hard and endanger our lives up there, but him, he's in Fort Knox, as it were, protected on all sides. Great guy. He's the sort of leader we need, but we're beginning to see through him. And Nehemiah understood too that word of his actions, if he followed the directives of Shemaiah. Word of his actions would surely get out. You couldn't have the governor of Judah spending a night in the holy place of the temple without the priests knowing and the Levites knowing and other people who were in and around the temple knowing and you could never keep a lid on such a story. And then of course he knows that Shemaiah would be telling everybody about it too kind of a living open letter to spread this far and wide. And so verse 12 begins, Lo, I perceived that God had not sent him. Because God, the God who is true and non-contradictory, God would not be speaking contrary to the call that he has placed upon my life. And 
God would not be commanding me to sin. And it is especially clear that entering the temple's holy place for someone not a priest or even a Levite is sinful. It's forbidden. And Isaiah 8 verse 20 states, To the law and to the testimony, if anyone speaks not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Here's a man claiming to be a prophet. He's telling me to do something which is contrary to the word of God. That means there's no light in him. That means he's a false prophet. And if people thought that way, that is thought biblically and clearly, all the false churches in Northern Ireland and around the rest of the British Isles and around the world would be empty next Sunday morning because people would realize the minister from the pulpit is saying things that contradict Scripture. That is the very mark of false prophecy. Therefore, he's a false minister. Therefore, it's a false church. Therefore, I'm not going there. But the problem is, to quote Jeremiah, the prophets prophesy falsely, and my people, nominal people, love to have it so. That's actually what the people want. Because they're just as false as the ministers. A false prophet and the preacher, and false Christians in the pew. But Nehemiah, he didn't think the way your nominal false Christian thinks. He understood biblically. And of course, this raises the question. If God is not speaking to me through Shemaiah and his false prophecy, who is behind it? Now let's think this through. Who is there who wants to make me afraid? Verse 13 mentions this, and this morning we saw it in verse 9. Who is there who wants to make me afraid? Mm, mm, I have to think about that. Who is there who wants me to go to inappropriate places for strange meetings? Who is there who has been trying desperately, even five times within recent memory, to induce me to sin? Who is there? who has been trying to malign me and make me look bad before the people of Judah? Now, there only is one answer to those questions. Let's look at it from another angle. Who is there who certainly has enough money to hire people in Jerusalem? Who is there who hates me and the work of building Jerusalem's walls so much that they're willing to bribe a prophet in order to lie to me, to get me. And Nehemiah joins the dots. The dots only lead to one place. You could even say, follow the money. The answer is Tobiah and Sambala. Verse 12, Lo, I perceive that God had not sent him. Well, why was he saying this then? But that he, Shemaiah, pronounced this prophecy against me. For Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so, do as he said, going into the temple, and sin. And that they might have a matter for an evil report that they might reproach me. He has rumbled them. So Nehemiah concludes this section with another prayer. One of many such prayers inserted at key points in this book. And it is a prayer against certain people. It's a prayer against Tobiah and Sanballat. It's a prayer against the prophetess, Noadiah who is only mentioned in this verse. And just as the Old Testament 
had prophets, true prophets and true prophetesses. It also had true prophetesses like Miriam and false prophetesses like those mentioned in Ezekiel 13. And the office of prophet and prophetess was an extraordinary and temporary office and it involved direct revelation if you were a true prophet or prophetess. And if you were a false, it involved the claim of direct revelation. And this says nothing about women in the permanent and ordinary offices of pastor, elder, or deacon, which is explicitly forbidden in 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. So this is a prayer against Tobiah and Sanballat, who are behind the whole thing, with Tobiah bankrolling the project, the false prophetess Noadiah, and the false prophets, masculine and plural, so that that would include Shemaiah and others. He had a whole slew of false prophets whom he could bribe to promote his message deep within the church, even in Nehemiah's day. This prayer then against these evil people is an imprecatory prayer. Nehemiah prays to God, Remember these wicked people. Remember, O Lord, what they did. They uttered false prophecy, that is, they lied through their teeth and claimed that this was thy word, O God. And they lied through their teeth, false prophecy, against the servant of Christ who was doing thy will and seeking to build the walls of Jerusalem against the enemies of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Remember them, Lord, and what they did. And punish them accordingly. And so Nehemiah's prayer here is like that in chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, which the, the governor made after the evil mockery of God's people and work. And imprecatory prayers against God's enemies, we call upon the name of the God who is over all as the Lord of hosts, helps remove the crippling fear of man when you realize the Almighty's out there and he is a strict and terrible judge. And it helps restore the fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. Verse 14, my God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works and think on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear got me into a bind so that the people no longer trusted me and so stopped the completion of the wall so that we were exposed to all of our enemies. And then finally, all of the gates were hung. Remember chapter 3 mentioned 10 gates. Each one was hung. And the wall was finished. Now listen for the twos and the fives as we read verse 15. So the wall was finished in the 25th day of the month Elo in 50 days. So here we have the date of the wall's completion, the 25th of Elo, that's the 25th of the 6th month of the year, which is according to the experts about the beginning of October in 445 BC. The very day. Here we have too, not only the date of the wall's completion, but the duration of the construction work, 52 days, as many weeks as there are in a year, if it helps you fix the number in your head, 52 days. And that was a marvelous thing. Josephus, writing about 500 years later, 
thought, well, there's no way they really could have done it in that time. So he, he made up the number 840 days. Must have taken him 840 days and sucked that out of his thumb. It took 52 days. That's what God's word says. And in fact, in days, in terms of days of actual labor, the labor of building, it was less than 52 days because there were Sabbaths in there, the seventh day of the week, and there were seven or eight Sabbath days of rest, days in which it would have been lawful to guard. Security work is lawful on the Lord's day, but not really to build. And... Nehemiah 4 verse 15 tells us in the days when there was the strongest likelihood of their being attacked, they actually took a short break and there was no building. So in fact, there were about 40 days on which the people laid stones and fitted gates. So you could say there were about 40 days of actual building by the 40 or so work teams around the perimeter. And this is an amazing and God-honoring achievement in so short a time that after 141 years of the walls being destroyed by the Babylonians, finally they were rebuilt and they did it in about 40 days of actual labor and about 52 days from the first day to the last and this is a remarkable achievement too given the persistent opposition both from without and from within and Nehemiah was right when he said before ever a brick was laid the God of heaven he will prosper us chapter 2 verse 20 and the God of heaven did prosper us. He told the people before the start, the God of heaven will prosper us. And he did. And then the text tells us how the various parties reacted to the completion of Jerusalem's perimeter defenses. Now doubtless, doubtless God's people rejoiced with a great joy. As they did, for instance, when they returned from the Babylonian captivity, we're going to sing Psalm 126 later, as they did when Jerusalem's temple was completed by Zerubbabel in Ezra chapter 6. But strikingly, Nehemiah 6, verses 15 and 16, actually doesn't mention the happy response of the people of God. Instead, it deals exclusively with the ungodly pagans' reaction. Which was always bad to any and every advance in God's work of rebuilding Jerusalem's fortifications. You will remember, whenever they heard in chapter 2 verse 10... There is a man coming to Jerusalem who sought the welfare of Israel. They were exceedingly grieved. And then later when they heard that the Jews are going to rebuild the walls, they laughed them to scorn. 2 verse 19. Whenever the work on the walls started, they mocked chapter 4 verse 1 and following. Whenever the wall was half up, they conspired to attack Jerusalem chapter 4 verse 7 and following whenever all the walls were complete and only the gates needed to be hung they tried to arrange mischievous meetings with Nehemiah to stop the work at the 11th hour chapter 6 verses 14 1 through 14 and now when the gates were fitted and the whole thing was finished they were devastated chapter 6 Verse 16, you have to say they were consistent. They consistently hated the church and they consistently hated the raising of the defensive walls around the church from the very beginning to the very end. You can't charge them with hypocrisy, though you can charge them with every other sin under heaven. 
And two points are made here regarding the enemies. Enemies here refers to the immediately surrounding peoples, the Samaritans, the Arabians, the Ammonites, the Philistines. And then the heathen, those are the nations a bit further away, the Syrians, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians. Two points are made regarding them. The first was it affected, interestingly enough, their view of themselves. Quote, they were much cast down in their own eyes. We might say their pride took a beating. They thought that they were powerful and wonderful. And then when the walls were up, they were forced to admit that they just weren't as super as they reckoned they were. And this too is a fulfillment, an answer to Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 4, verse 4. Turn their reproach upon their own head. And we should pause to think what the impenitent enemies of God's church will say on the judgment day when all of their hatred and wicked ploys in church and state are exposed and they're shown to be totally depraved sinners and wicked lawless enemies of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 says they were much cast down in their own eyes, these people. What's it going to be like on that day when all, all the secrets of men are revealed? And then second, they had a new view of the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. <coughs> These were the same people who said a couple of chapters before that a fox would come along and swipe his tail and knock the whole wall down. Now they're forced to admit that this wall was a divine accomplishment. That Jehovah was the one behind it all the living and true God, and they knew it fine well. Psalm 126, we're going to sing it after a bit. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. Then the next bit says, the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. The ungodly don't say it. They say the Lord hath done great things for them, whereof we're not glad. And on their knees, before the great white throne, the wicked will confess, here's the parallel with verse 16, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that salvation was entirely his work of grace alone, that he has glorified his beautiful bride, the church, so that she's without spot or wrinkle, and that the entire creation and history of the world was, after all, despite all the lies, his story, so that all things worked together for good for his elect people. Glory to God on the highest. They perceived that this work, now salvation and world history, was wrought of our God. That's what's going to happen on the judgment day. And you might have thought, beloved, that now that the walls are finally completed, that the opposition would cease. But even though the walls were up, the enemy didn't give up. And even though the ungodly admitted that the work was wrought of God himself, as they do in verse 16, they still opposed it, and they kept up their intrigues. And this is another indication of the madness of sin and the depths of hatred. We come to the fifth column here. The traitor's 
inside Israel who conspired with the external enemy. How did they come to ally themselves with Tobiah? Who, after all, wanted to send in an army and slaughter them? That's how stupid they were. He did it, first of all, by mixed marriages. Not just one mixed marriage, but two. Shechaniah gave his daughter's hand in marriage to Tobiah. That would be like a man in this church giving his daughter in marriage to a man whom we know wants to come into the church with a machine gun and shoot us all. And Meshullam's daughter married Tobias' son, the aforementioned Johanan. So here are two prominent families in Judah, within Jerusalem, that are in-laws to Tobiah. They're there at the weddings, they're there at birthdays and family get-togethers. And now it gets worse. This Shechaniah, he was the son of Ara, our text tells us, who was one of the leading returnees under Zerubbabel in Ezra 2 verse 5. And then it gets worse. This Meshullam, whose daughter is married into Tobias' family, Meshullam, the son of Berechiah, he has been mentioned earlier in the book of Nehemiah. Here's Nehemiah 3, verse 4, referring to the builders of the wall. Next unto them repaired Meshullam, the son of Berechiah. Here's a wall builder who actually was an in-law of Tobiah. And then it gets worse. Verse 30 of Nehemiah 3 says, After him repaired Meshullam, the son of Berechiah, over against his chamber. This Meshullam, who is an in-law of Tobiah, he actually did two portions. And we were thinking to ourselves, this is a really devout man. But things aren't always what they seem in the church. And God alone knows the heart. And it takes time and history to move forward to you see what people really believe and what's really going on. Mixed marriages. And when you get church members who marry the ungodly, it weakens the church terribly. And it adversely affects the children. And by your example and prayers and instruction you are to see that your children do not marry and therefore do not waste their time dating and getting themselves into trouble dating unbelievers because you are building up for yourself misery for your child you're working division into your own family and you're going to damage the church if you end up staying in the church mixed marriages People allying themselves with evil to buy a three mixed marriages. And then it gets worse. There were people allying themselves with Tobiah by oaths. Verse 18. There were many in Judah sworn unto him. Many of them. Not just the two families connected to Tobiah through marriage, but there were many people who had taken an oath to him. And then you say, well, what sort of people in Judah? The text tells us that it wasn't the common folk, it was the nobles, the people with more money and more property. And in the book of Nehemiah, sadly, the nobles were the ones who didn't do as well, the moneyed, powerful people in society. You will recall that the Tekoite nobility were lazy and arrogant and who did not put their necks to the work of the Lord in building the walls of Jerusalem in chapter 3, verse 5. The nobles were the greedy usurers who oppressed their own brethren and took some of their children as slaves. Chapter 5, verse 7. The nobles were the worst Sabbath breakers. Chapter 13, verse 7. And here... The nobles were prominent as the traitors, the fifth column in Israel. 
Just because you've got money in the church doesn't mean you're any more spiritual than anybody else. And in general, it might mean you're a bit dodgier, but not necessarily. And here's the strange thing. These people had taken oaths to Tobiah. Can you imagine if Nehemiah had said, I want everyone to come up, we're going to have a meeting, and everyone swear with their hand on their heart or in the hand, or on the Bible, or whatever we were going to do it, everyone swear to be faithful to me, because I'm going to rule according to the word of God, and we're going to serve him together. If he had said that, people would have said he was a total fanatic, and they would have refused it, understandably so. But people were actually willing to swear oaths to Tobiah, a man who had done all he could to stop the rebuilding of Jerusalem's wall, including conspiring to attack the Jews with an army and slaughter them. There were actually people in the church who'd be willing to take an oath to him. Huh. So these nobles then, in Judah, they swore to Tobiah, maybe it started off as a trade agreement, I'll buy and sell from you, and then it included spying on Nehemiah and reporting to Tobiah about his actions. They took an oath to that effect. So that there's a steady stream of correspondence between Tobiah and many nobles of Judah. There were many letters from Judean traders going to Tobiah reporting as spies. This is what Nehemiah is doing. This is what he is saying. And Tobiah gathers this information from his various spies within the church. And then he tries to use this information for his own nefarious ends against the governor of Judah and the people of God. I mean, you couldn't make it up. And then there were letters from Tobiah to these Judean nobles, giving them material that they could use to spin to Nehemiah. Verse 19. These nobles reported Tobiah's good deeds before me. And Proverbs 28 verse 4 says, They that forsake the law praise the wicked. They reported the good deeds or the good works of Tobiah to Nehemiah. His good works. Yeah. Here was the prayer of Nehemiah. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat according to these their works, bribing prophets to lie against me. And these good works of Tobiah, whatever they were, they weren't good works as defined by Scripture and summed in the Heidelberg Catechism in question and answer 91 that says a good work is only that performed out of true faith, only that which is according to God's law, and only that which has as its goal Jehovah's glory. Unless they believed in common grace, that an unbeliever could do good works in the eyes of God. Yeah. And Nehemiah knew fine well about Tobiah's good works. His wise crack about the fox knocking down the walls. His plotting this surprise attack on the builders of the walls and bribing false prophets and Noadiah to ensnare him. And sadly, this is a lesson in Scripture for the church of all ages. They had this in Calvin's Geneva, for instance. There are people in the church, they're always there, time and space, who fraternize with those who hate the church. And maybe they do this because they're naive <coughs> or because they're bitter or they like to gossip, but they're not helping themselves and they're not helping the church. But let's move on. Finally, no, Tobiah had the absolute cheek even to mail epistles to Nehemiah himself. I mean, what a nerve that guy had. Verse 19, Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear after it all. And the, this chapter, Nehemiah 6, talks about scare tactics. 
verse 9, verse 13, verse 14, verse 19. It's all about frightening people and frightening their leaders in the church, putting pressure on them so that the council of the church will make bad decisions and kowtow to people. So a church discipline won't be enacted according to the word of God. So that the preaching will be toned down so that sins that people love won't be touched upon. So that the general assembly or synod of the church won't be governed by the rule of Christ, but the rule of self-willed people. And you know what? There actually wasn't much that Nehemiah could do about it directly. These various evil things that are going on in verses 17 through 19. He couldn't stop it. He just had to grin and bear it. And he didn't let it get him down. Nehemiah understood Paul's lesson in 2 Timothy 2, 25. That there are some people who only are opposing and hurting themselves. You can't actually address it directly. And you just let the Lord Take care of it. And our Savior said, In this world ye shall have tribulation. That's a fact. Live with it. Get on with it. In this world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. By my cross. By my resurrection from the dead. By my ascension into heaven. Since my session at God's right hand. And we're to be of good cheer because Jesus also said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word that we understand the teaching of scripture. We see how it applies to ourselves and we're watchful, prayerful, Keep us from evil because we know we're sinful and corrupt. In Jesus' name, amen.